Hi everyone, after reading through chapter one about our cells, you probably think that the phrase, you are what you eat, is pretty accurate. However, more specifically, it should be, you are what you digest, absorb, and transfer to your cells. In chapter two, we'll be going over exactly how digestion and absorption occurs and what can affect it. The understanding of this will be crucial to your understanding of client digestive issues and we all know people who have experienced gas, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, and even digestive disorders. So in this video, we'll review key concepts of the chapter, as well as branch out and discuss a few real life conditions and how to approach it as a coach. First, why the heck is digestion even an important subject? Well, if all is working well, then you'll absorb 92 to 97% of your food. But if you or your client are suffering from conditions like inflammatory bowel disease, untreated celiac disease, food poisoning, or untreated food intolerances, then the rate of absorption will be affected because these conditions often lead to a flattening of the intestinal villi and ultimately diarrhea, which means food moves too quickly to be absorbed. And you'll see why that's important a bit later on and why you'll need to consider this when talking about nutrition. Second, let's go over what digestion even is. It refers to our body separating molecules and breaking them up into more complex substances through chemical and mechanical means. It also sorts and divides molecules by type and then sends them to be used or stored in our body. And it arranges, transports, and excretes whatever the body needs or doesn't need. In other words, we just chew and swallow, the food gets pulled apart and nutrients get transferred to where they need to go, without us even realizing what's going on. Of course, we can't have digestion without the gastrointestinal tract, or rather, the GI tract, which is a muscular canal that is about 26 feet long, extending from our mouth to our anus. However, the GI tract is more than just digestion. It also brings in and processes nutrients, acts as a barrier to chemical and physical pathogens, detoxifies potentially harmful substances, excretes waste, contains the enteric nervous system, otherwise known as our second brain, it excretes hormones and helps process them, it helps regulate our immune system, and it's innervated by nerves involved in social engagement and emotion, which gives us important signals about the world and how we feel. So basically, our GI tract is pretty darn important to a lot of body functions, so it's important to have a functioning one. When we think of digestion, we often think of just our stomach. However, believe it or not, digestion first begins in our brain. When our stomach gets hungry, it tells our brain to get up and get moving to locate food. Our nose can also send signals to our brain. So just imagine this. You walk past a bakery and there's a smell of fresh bread or pastries that passes by your nose. Suddenly, your mouth is filled with saliva and your stomach grumbles. This is no coincidence. Smelling and seeing food is enough to trigger the beginning of digestion. Your body preps by moistening your mouth with saliva and ultimately, it sends a signal to your stomach to start emptying and prep for new food to come in. If a client is under a tremendous amount of chronic stress or experiencing stress currently, then it will ultimately affect their digestion on a day-to-day -day basis. One day, you may have a client talk about all of their upset stomach and digestive difficulties, and you may initially think it's food sensitivities. But don't overlook the power that stress and emotional upset can have on the GI tract. Other parts of the nervous system that are involved include the central nervous system, which controls appetite and food-seeking behavior and sensory input from foods, our peripheral nervous system, which helps us pick up and eat food with our limbs and muscles, and the enteric nervous system, which is localized in the gut and often referred to as the second brain because it helps to deliver our physiological and emotional state to our brain. Now that we've discussed everything and poop has left the building, now what? Well, let's go back and look at how the endocrine system is involved in the digestive process. You've likely had a few clients asking you what ghrelin is or leptin, because these two are the most commonly spoken about hormones in relation to fullness and hunger. You probably don't have a lot of clients asking, hey, what's oxyntomodulin? 
Whatever information is most talked about, you might need to be prepared to answer a question from a client. So let's go over those two most commonly spoken about hormones, ghrelin and leptin. Ghrelin is important for the feelings of hunger. So we have the highest amount of it right before a meal and the lowest right after a meal. Those who are fasting or who have chronically low intakes of food will have ghrelin released more often to attempt to signal that their body is hungry. Leptin is important for shutting down hunger. It's secreted by fat cells. So the more fat cells you have, the more leptin you have. Leptin is responsible for regulating energy balance as well, meaning the amount of food you consume. It does this by signaling to the brain when we're full. So it's the opposite of ghrelin. Leptin is at its highest after a meal when we are likely to be full. On the flip side, leptin is lowest when you don't have a lot of body fat or energy coming in, and when it gets low, we get hungry. Leptin is also at its lowest right around noon, which means hello afternoon munchies. It's important for you as a coach to know and understand these terms and all of the other hormones mentioned in the chapter, but your clients don't necessarily need to know all of this unless they ask about it specifically. In today's video, we're going to be discussing macronutrients, more specifically carbohydrates, fats, and proteins which means we're now getting into the bulk of the food your clients consume, so it's pretty important. Macronutrients influence our ability to digest food, absorb nutrients, produce hormones, and they impact our immune function, cell structure and function, our body composition, and metabolic function. And we'll learn about how carbohydrates, fats, and proteins play a role in each of these processes. However, it's important to note that macronutrients differ from micronutrients which refers to our vitamins and minerals. Macronutrients directly supply energy to our bodies, whereas micronutrients do not. Macronutrients are also consumed in larger quantities than micronutrients, but we'll discuss more about micronutrients in the next chapter. Carbohydrates are also responsible for regulating our blood sugar. Our body can move about 20 grams of glucose through our blood every hour, which is the equivalent of a piece of fruit. If your blood sugar drops too low, your body will take some of the 80 to 100 grams of stored glycogen to help raise your blood sugar again. Similarly, your muscles can store 300 to 600 grams of glycogen, depending on how much muscle you have. This means the more muscle you have, the more your body will store carbohydrates as glycogen, and the less likely it will be stored as triglycerides, or affect your blood sugar levels negatively. This means weight training is a crucial part of managing your blood sugar and your triglyceride levels. Since carbohydrates are responsible for managing blood sugar, when you hear the terms glycemic index, glycemic load, or insulin index, this refers to how carbohydrates interact with your body. However, glycemic index can pose a problem because we don't normally consume carbohydrates on their own, nor do we consume exactly 50 grams at all times. Glycemic index and glycemic load also do not take into consideration other factors, such as how much exercise we've had, whether we're eating protein, fat, or fiber along with the carbohydrates, or what time the meal was eaten, so it can make these measures less reliable. With the insulin index, insulin is affected by more than just carbohydrate consumption. High protein and high fat foods also stimulate an insulin response, so it may not always accurately reflect the effect that carbohydrates specifically have on insulin levels. Here's a simplified approach. Minimally processed foods with carbohydrates are often digested slower and have a balanced blood sugar response. Conversely, highly processed foods with carbohydrates will often digest more quickly and raise blood sugar levels more sharply. It's important to explain to clients that not all carbohydrates are created equal. You may have some clients who feel that all carbohydrates are bad, but what if their workouts are suffering? What if they're losing muscle because they're eating such a low carbohydrate diet? You can help guide them towards minimally processed carbohydrates that are higher in fiber to prevent these scenarios from happening. For example, beans, which are also rich in fiber and protein along with carbohydrates, will provide long-lasting energy, prevent blood sugar swings, aid in elimination, and help keep us fuller for longer so we end up eating a reasonable amount of food. 
Let's compare that to sugar and white flour. Both are refined and lack fiber and nutrients. They will also provide only a short burst of energy and then you come crashing down and possibly create even more sugar cravings. You also end up getting hungrier because it's not filling, so you may end up consuming more food in the long run. So you can see, and let your clients know that not all carbohydrates are created equal and that consuming certain ones like fruits, starchy vegetables, whole grains, beans and legumes can actually aid in their performance, energy and mental functioning without contributing to weight gain. Our second macronutrient is fat. And the simplest form of fat is a fatty acid. Just like carbohydrates have glucose monosaccharides, fat has fatty acids. Three fatty acids join together with glycerol in order to make triglycerides, which, as you just learned, can also be formed by excess glucose in our blood. Fat comes in two major categories, saturated and unsaturated. Saturated fat simply means that the entire carbon chain is saturated with hydrogen atoms. Due to the saturation, it's usually solid or semi-solid at room temperature. Just think of butter, coconut oil, and cocoa butter. However, if this carbon chain has double bonds, it means the entire chain is not fully saturated with hydrogen atoms. Therefore, it's considered unsaturated. Unsaturated fats are usually liquid at room temperature. Just think of most vegetable oils. Unsaturated fats are also broken down into monounsaturated and polyunsaturated categories. And you guessed it, mono means one double bond, or rather one unsaturated carbon atom, and poly means more than one carbon has a double bond, or rather more than one unsaturated carbon atom. Omega-3 and 6 fatty acids are examples of polyunsaturated fatty acids. These kind of fatty acids are found in foods like nuts and seeds and seafood. Foods like olives and avocados contain a lot more monounsaturated fatty acids. What does fat do for us? It provides us with energy. It's the most energy dense macronutrient with 9 calories of energy per gram. As well, fat is a primary energy source for kids under the age of 14 and a secondary energy source for adults, not to mention a crucial energy source for endurance athletes. Fat also helps make and balance steroid hormones such as our sex hormones and corticosteroid hormones. It also forms our cell membranes, our brains, and our nervous system. Remember the phospholipid bilayer? Fat also helps to transport fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, and it gives us two fatty acids that we can't make on our own, the omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. These benefits are from all fats, both saturated and unsaturated, so we don't want a diet that's completely void of any of those. We want a balance. That means a wide variety of minimally processed fats is likely best for everyone to consume. In order to boost your client's intake of monounsaturated fats, have them consume things like almonds, avocado, cashews, olives, peanuts, and egg yolk. Yes, egg yolk isn't just fully saturated. To boost your client's intake of polyunsaturated fats, have them consume things like chia seeds, oily fish, flax seeds, hemp seeds, pine nuts, and walnuts. You may even need to help your clients boost their intake of saturated fat, particularly if they don't eat any animal protein. For someone following a vegan diet, this means adequate amounts of coconut oil, coconut milk, or shredded coconut, and even dark chocolate due to the cocoa butter. For vegetarian clients, this means whole milk products and butter are great sources along with the sources that are also vegan. Our third macronutrient is protein. The structure of protein includes carbon and hydrogen molecules, just like carbohydrates and fat, but they also contain a nitrogen as part of their amino group. The smallest unit of protein is the amino acid, which is similar to the monosaccharide of glucose and carbohydrates and the fatty acid and fats. Amino acids all have four characteristics. They have an amino group on one end, a carboxyl group on the other end, a central alpha carbon, and a side chain called an R group, which differentiates one amino acid from another. These amino acids form peptides or peptide chains when joined together. These peptide chains make up what we call the primary protein structure. But we can also have secondary, tertiary, or quaternary structures. Secondary structures have strength and stiffness. It can form either an alpha helix or beta sheet. 
tertiary structures occur when secondary structures loop into a globular shape. If one or more tertiary structures join together, that's when we get quaternary structures. Even though protein can be more complex through these structures, when we digest protein, we break them all down into small peptides and amino acids, since this is what our body will use. So now you know how protein digests, why we need it, sources of protein, and how the quality of protein is calculated. But how much protein do you and your clients need? For sedentary, generally healthy adults, they'll need about 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body mass. This means 55 grams for a 150 pound person and 72 grams for a 200 pound person. However, it doesn't mean that the average person is getting quality protein just because they are getting enough for their body to have protein turnover and prevent protein malnutrition. That's the bare minimum. Our protein requirements go up if we are training hard, have a physical job, are injured, sick, or recovering from surgery, and if we are losing protein due to chronic physical stress or poor digestion. For an athlete, the American College of Sports Medicine and Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics recommends 1.2 to 1.7 grams per kilogram of body mass, whereas the International Society of Sports Nutrition recommends 1.4 to 2 grams of protein per kilogram of body mass. And in other recent reviews, it was recommended to have 1.2 to 2.2 grams per kilogram of body mass. The upper limit of what healthy livers and kidneys can handle is 3.5 to 4.5 grams per kilogram of body mass per day. This means 238 to 306 grams of protein for your 150 pound client. However, some clients require a lower intake due to kidney disease, certain metabolic diseases like PKU, liver disease, homocysteinuria, or problems with gastric emptying since protein tends to take a longer time to digest. While you can't provide medical nutrition therapy, you can help with meal ideas and a meal plan that suits their doctor prescribed needs. You've just learned a lot of information, but all you really need to discuss with your clients are these five things. One, how much food they're eating each day and if they are eating the right amounts for their goals. Two, how they are eating. For example, are they eating slowly and enjoying their food? Three, why are they eating each day? For example, are they eating when they're actually hungry? Four, what are they eating each day? For example, do they consume mostly minimally processed foods from all categories of macronutrients? And five, are they doing all of this consistently? If not, keep it simple and focus on how much, why, and what they're eating first, and whether they're doing it consistently. And don't forget to keep the big picture in mind. Welcome back. Today, we're going to be discussing the little nutrients, like vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients, which are all referred to as micronutrients. But they're only little because we need much less of them than macronutrients. They actually play a big role in how our body functions. We'll discuss what they are, their importance, and what you can do with your clients. First and foremost, as a nutrition coach, you'll want to ensure that your client is emphasizing minimally processed whole foods. If this foundation isn't in place, there's no sense in worrying about the smaller details. Second, you'll want to encourage a variety of minimally processed foods to increase the variety of nutrients they are consuming. For instance, encouraging more colorful fruits and veggies because they have an abundance of micronutrients in them. So you see, those are two really simple things you can implement without going into the finer details of every single nutrient or giving them a giant chart of what nutrients are in each food and potentially overwhelming your client. Eating a variety of minimally processed whole colorful foods is nature's multivitamin and mineral. There are actually two types of vitamins, fat soluble and water soluble. Vitamins A, D, E, and K are fat soluble, which means they are absorbed passively in the GI tract and travel attached to dietary fat to aid in absorption. We also store this type of vitamin in our bodies, so there will be an upper limit of consumption. Vitamins B and C are water soluble which means they are absorbed passively and actively in the GI tract using carrier proteins for active transport. Since they're soluble in water and we excrete quite a bit daily, we don't end up storing these in large quantities, except for B12. So why are vitamins even important? Well, one of their most important jobs is to be cofactors for enzymes. But as a coach, it's important to get to know these finer details so that you can explain it if you wanted or needed to 
and to help you understand why certain things are important. For instance, understanding that fat-soluble vitamins are absorbed in the GI tract and travel attached to dietary fat is helpful to understand why fat-soluble vitamins, whether through food or supplement form, are best consumed with dietary fat. Now that's information you can pass along to your clients if they are supplementing or in need of absorbing fat-soluble vitamins more effectively. In today's video, we're going to be discussing the PN coaching methodology. The PN coaching methodology is ultimately about two things, helping people change and helping them take meaningful action in their own lives. We'll do this by applying the information you learned from the chapter and placing it into a real life scenario. Nutrition coaching isn't just about nutrition. It involves clients' psychology, worldview, lifestyle, environments, and a host of other factors that shape their food and eating. And it's up to you to tailor to your unique client's situations and revise over time. At PN, we're constantly observing carefully and noting what works and what doesn't. And then we revise where necessary. And you should take the same approach. Keep your ears and eyes open. Your clients can teach you a lot too. As a coach, you have a few tasks and they include assessing and gathering data about your clients, organizing that data into a coherent and meaningful story, using data to make informed decisions and to help your clients understand their situation, observing and monitoring your clients over time, looking for changes, progress, opportunities for relationship building and learning moments, seeking to understand your client's values, priorities, goals, mindset, and underlying motivations, helping clients understand basic nutrition, exercise, and behavior change material, and answer questions when needed. Helping clients reflect on insights, ambivalence, resistance, and shifts in perspective that come up, providing clear, concrete, immediately usable feedback, for example, connecting the dots between how clients are living and what results they're getting, being present with clients on their journey, helping clients self-regulate, focus, and manage the normal feelings that come with change, helping them plan, anticipate, strategize, and decide on a course of action, and helping them execute that action plan. These may seem like a lot of tasks, but if you look at the big picture here, you'll notice that you're not the expert or authority figure telling your client what to do. You're a guide and facilitator working with your clients to help them move forward with their goals. This doesn't mean that you can't share your opinions, knowledge, and insight. It just means keep the big picture in mind that you and your clients are working together on the client's goal, not your goal. So now that you know your tasks, let's look at the six steps of coaching. Step one, assessing, gathering data, and identifying client goals. Step two, understanding the client and building the story. Step three, creating an action plan and possible next steps. Step four, choosing one next action step and testing it. Step five, observing and monitoring what happens. Step six, using outcome-based decision-making. This is a cyclical process because step one will occur the first day you meet with a client, but you may also want to do this periodically with them as they evolve. Step five also looks a lot like step one, and as you gather more data, you'll be revisiting step two. As well, based on what happens in step five and six, you may need to revisit step three to develop a new action plan if it didn't end up being helpful or useful. 